Continuing our trek to Gaines Mill, we have the Battle of First Winchester. This is our last battle before we hit the big time, so it's also our last chance to get our colonels some experience. I'm going to start by dropping the point into Army Organization, and then moving to arrange First Corps. I'm going to be very direct. I'll be bringing eight brigades, the two one-star cannons, and six brigades of Springfield-equipped infantry led by five colonels and the Mouse Master. I'll also be refilling them to 2,000 men apiece. And that's about it. Yes, sir. We've decided to launch offensive operations on the Union forces in the Shenandoah Valley, preventing them from reinforcing their offensive against Richmond. We must use a bold strategy by employing audacity and rapid, unpredictable movements on the whole valley. Therefore, you'll use a small, flexible force. The rest of your army will take positions at the outskirts of our capital. The Union commander of the Department of the Shenandoah, Major General Nathaniel P. Banks, is attempting to reorganize his army at Winchester and defend the town. Move swiftly and attack the Union force. Before I hit the go button, I'd just like to say, I realize my recon skill is kinda low, but I'm a bit skeptical about the whole 15 brigades in a single division up here. It seems that the Federals decided to give a battle and deployed around the town of Winchester. Our scouts report that General Banks has no more than four brigades, supported by artillery and light units. You have at your disposal a significant force to crush the Federal Army and capture the city. The enemy is outnumbered, so we need you to prevail on the field. Bring us a victory and inflict at least 30% more casualties to the enemy. Godspeed, General. That 30% qualifier is in no way required for victory. This is a standard secure and hold mission. The other part though, the one about them only having four infantry brigades, is accurate. And the general is nobody's fool. He'll be deploying his four infantry in these woods, with his two cannon batteries backing them up from here. There is also a lone, random, skirmish cavalry brigade hanging out in the center west side, a melee cav will reinforce eventually from here, and skirmish teams will be scattered around. The weakness to Banks' defenses is that the capture point isn't actually in the woods he's setting up in. As such, we can win this stage easily by pulling a Maginot and going around it. Of the two approaches, the one on the right tends to take more artillery hits, and the one on the left gets more harassed by skirmishers. I'll be taking the right path, as I can deal with scattered artillery shots easier than I can four or five fast brigades popping in and out to take flanking shots. There's also the chance that the Union doesn't pull their artillery back in time, letting me maul them as I come around. It doesn't always happen, but when it does, it's great. The town's defensive bonus is superior to even that of the woods, so by getting my entire team in on the right map edge and then turning west, I can fight almost this entire battle from a 100% cover rating, and with the added bonus that the enemy has to come to me since I'll be in possession of their objective. One other benefit to going right is that one of the enemy skirmishers starts within firing range of the deployment box here. 
You'll get to see how well that works for them in a bit. And to take advantage of that poorly positioned posse of people, I'll plot my platoon of personages right here. I'll also remove one of the supply wagons. I only need a single one to supply the whole town, no sense risking both. It's important to order your infantry all the way to the border. The two-columned fast march formation they use only holds until they get about 50 feet from the target, and we are going to want them to use that formation all the way until they are at the town. It's always good practice when giving infantry distant marching orders to give them a location behind the actual destination, as long as you aren't expecting to run into an enemy force before they arrive, just so that they keep in the fast march style. Johnston, like last map, will be running interference, taking long-range cannon shots so that my clumped infantry don't. You may notice my forces are going into and out of visual range of the opponents, but don't count on that in your own game. Where the enemy's skirmishers are can result in wildly different spots by the Union. It's better just to let the general take the random artillery shot rather than hope no one does.
Once you reach about halfway down the city edge, deactivate the hold fire command, turn west, and spread out. Have the infantry that guards the south of the town split off a skirmisher. It's rare that an enemy infantry will engage these guys, but skirmishers and cavalry love to charge up the bottom right if given the chance, and we don't want them to sneak in. And, apparently, an enemy supply wagon enters the map in the town right at 5.52 on the clock. Sucks to be them. I'm sending them to the north border since that's where the retreat point is. I'll just hope they don't run into the reinforcement cavalry en route. as it turns out, the Union doesn't want to lose its objective right at the map's start. I knew when starting this map it would be a slog, and as such, there's a reason I chose it after Cross Keys in Port Republic. Each of the three side missions reduces the size of the enemy brigades in the other two side missions, and I wanted First Winchester to have the smallest size possible. Granted, I wasn't aware I was going to get charged by the entire army right out of the gate. I thought I was just shrinking their size so the protracted gun battle at the town's and forest's edge would go smoother. But I'm certainly not complaining about having superior numbers to go with my superior position when repelling a charge. Should have had my general closer, though. My bad. There's the extra enemy cavalry. Seems the captured wagon will make it to the border safely after all.
With the enemy's charge repelled, and their stamina meters not allowing for a repeat just yet, I'll send the southern infantry to chase the skirmisher I saw earlier into the corner and finish him off. Also, over the next few minutes, I'll rotate the infantry around a bit, so that the guys who exhausted themselves fending off the charge get replaced by some fresher bodies during the upcoming prolonged firefight. This positioning isn't ideal. While being in the town while the enemy occupies the thin strip of open field is hard to pull off, it's also fine if they are at the wood's edge. But having enemy brigades fighting from within the town's huge cover bonus really isn't how I want this dragged out fight to proceed. I'll take some steps to get those guys to back up, including slowly flanking with Hexamer and pulling my cannons up closer.
While it's tempting to go out hunting the enemy forces once you force them to run, don't forget that they are hiding in wooded cover. It's best to let them continue to make ill-fated rushes at your position for as long as they are willing to, only finally moving out to get them when it seems the only attacking they are left doing is cannon fire. If you are having trouble spotting someone to fire at, have some infantry split off skirmish teams to spot for you. Wow, they just killed a general. Which, since that wasn't the Mouse Master himself, means they nailed one of the guys leading the cannon batteries. That is quite unlucky to lose someone to splash damage like that, but it does demonstrate why I want to train my colonels into a large stable of generals for the grand battles. You're going to need some replacements sooner or later.
I did a bit of mobile experimenting with Hexamer's skirmishers here. I'll let you watch the video to see which locations he was able to get good vision angles from, so that you don't have to have him run around like I did to find that perfect spot. I'll slip into double speed here for a bit while I play Cat and Mouse Master with the remaining forces.
most of the enemies have fled the woods. Now's the time to go for the full surround. Admittedly, this isn't my smoothest encirclement ever. Really? I guess Gordon wants this stage to wrap up as much as I do. Yep, that's what it was. Based on the manpower meter at the top of the screen, the only things the Union has left is their supply and a half-dead cavalry running around somewhere. I'll start splitting around to try to find the last combatant, take the wagon, and maybe get a tad more stamina training in. One of my brigades does need to go back to the objective though, just in case that's where the horses are heading. Oh, hey, look at that. Hexamer arrives just in the nick of time. But we'll pretend that was intentional for cinematic effect and not just me getting lucky that he made it.
Winchester is secured, 4 to 1 casualties, and Banks' force was obliterated. Sitting in town exchanging fire allowed one of the enemy cannons to prevent me from dominating the leaderboards again. Sadly, General Siegfried fell this battle. Three colonels received promotions to fill the gap left by him, though. I said last video that the Union weren't using 12-pound howitzers anymore. I stand corrected. Also of note, I picked up 600-odd Lorenz rifles, which is definitely nice, given what I have planned for the next couple stages. The next video isn't going to be Gaines Mill. It will be a short video on core design philosophy. And since I know that it will involve getting the 6th Brigade per Division slot open, I'll go ahead and assign the career point to that right now. I'll see you then. Don't forget to bring your notebooks.